How big of a deal is it that a decision has not been made to abandon fossil fuels? So in the final text of COP27 uh, treaty, it's explicitly mentioned that we should phase down the use of coal, which is of course uh, necessary. Coal is the most uh, significant contributor to CO2 rise. And it is also recognized we need, it, we need to do it by 2030 in the rich countries and 2040 in, uh, in the other countries, so globally. So it's a very short period of time, but it's not explicitly written in the treaty. It's only written we have to reduce as much as possible coal, and there is no mention of oil and gas. That's why the observers, and I would agree, say that that's why it's very weak, uh, uh, very weak uh, tre treaty, and it loosely follows on Glasgow that it was already mentioned there. Basically, it's a very similar statement. So, yeah, uh, this is not enough, and uh, we really need to abandon all fossil fuels. And once it's not written in the final text, and there is no mechanisms to to so it can to, to make it happen and make it on the ground. It's really the crucial problem because you really have no instruments how to force countries to follow on their pledges. Isn't the fund for poor countries just a solution to the symptoms without solving the causes? The financial mechanisms that were agreed in Egypt are definitely a big progress compared to the previous conferences because there was no such agreement before. So specifically this new fund that is related to the damages and loss caused by climate change will be provided by rich countries to the poor countries. So it's a really good step in the, or a step in, in the good direction and it's very much needed. And it was a condition of poor countries to agree on the text of the, of the treaty. So I would say it's, it's a step in the, or, or, or a significant step forward compared to the previous ones. And yes, it's just an adaptation. Uh, it's not really addressing the cause of the problem. But on the other hand, it's uh, because we already feel the uh, impacts of the, of the problem that we didn't solve in the past. So it, it's really needed to have it uh, in this way and, and support poor countries. So yeah, it's, it's not solving the problem, but at this point uh, in 2022, we really cannot avoid helping poor countries to deal with uh, ongoing impacts, and that impact will get progressively worse, of course. 10. Does the war in Ukraine speed up or slow down the decarbonization of our planet? Uh, COP27 participants also uh, recognized in the final text that energy crisis that's ongoing in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere is contributing to the problems related to solving or mitigating climate change. So they realize it's connected to climate change problems. Uh, they don't specify uh, steps to, you know, uh, to involve it in, 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 in sort of solutions. But clearly there is recognition that uh, adverse uh, you know, events like war in Ukraine are hindering the possible or potential progress into the future. As I said before, it's a global problem. Uh, and it needs a global solution. The first COP, COP1, was uh, held in Berlin in 1995, and it was selected precisely because it was a symbol of end of Cold War period, the fall of uh, Iron Curtain uh, in Berlin. And the idea was to show that the world is united and that it can work on complex problems like climate change. So. Definitely, we need uh, cooperation and any war, any conflict, and it's not only in Ukraine, we have other conflicts as well in other countries, and they are definitely uh, making the progress much more complicated. Even so, in the short term, it can help in a way that we push you know, for saving energy, for trying to substitute fossil fuels. That, that's a good thing, but the bad thing is that we, we also, uh, when we are in crisis, we stop, you know, uh, concentrating our long-term problems like climate change, and we tend to concentrate on, uh, you know, these these acute problems, and we tend to ignore or 
you know, to push it behind again and, and not really deal with the these long-term problems. So it's both ways. It's good and bad. And of course, we should, you know, use as much of this for the good and try to limit the, the potential bad outcomes. Uh, I could mention also um, the cooperation between the big players, that is, you know, US, Russia, India, China. And it looks like the conversation or cooperation also in the climate era or sphere is a little bit uh, deteriorating in a way that these people are not really talking so much between each other, even uh, or, or also in these uh, climate conferences, then they would be talk if the relations are, let's say, peaceful or, or much better than, than under current conditions. Unsurprisingly, oil producing nations oppose limiting fossil fuel use. Yes, that's we have, what we have seen in uh, COP27 conference, oil rich countries, for instance, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, there was this uh, very strange statement uh, by the government officials that the problem is not fossil fuels, but uh, carbon emissions. But of course, we know that uh, fossil, uh, that uh, uh, CO2 emissions are the direct result of fossil fuels. So that was really sort of very strange to, to you know, to, to doubt about the core issue that is fossil fuels. The other thing is these countries, uh, and it's from history that they do it all the time, they push for technologies, right? So they want to carbon use carbon capture and storage or, you know, some other methods to, to avoid uh, reducing consumption because they get rid, that they get rich of these uh, resources. So that's understandable. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we really have to, let's say, push them for, uh, you know, some kind of agreement. So, yeah, it, it's understandable that they try to dilute the, these agreements and, and uh, you know, pledges and so on. But uh, there's nothing new. It happens all the time and uh, uh, it's, it, it's good to keep it in mind, but try to limit their influence as much as possible. Is the 1.5 degree window closed? When the Glasgow Climate Conference uh, ended in 2021, uh, the, base, the, the main outcome or main claim, or one of the main claims was that 1.5 uh, degree limit is alive. Uh, probably at the time that was already not true, because when we really look at the hard data on the, on the emissions, on the on the planned emissions, on the real world, we really are not on track on 1.5. Uh, in 2022, global carbon emission from fossil fuel sales will be again at a record, if nothing significantly changes until the end of the year. And this is really incompatible in one, with 1.5. All the climate scenarios that consider it realistic say that the global use of fossil fuels have to peak by 2020. So that didn't happen. Uh, so the chance of keeping under 1.5 is really increasingly small. It, it's actually, we expect now with a one to one probability, with 50% probability, that in, in five years we will cross 1.5 temperature limit, at least for one year. So we are, yeah, so the trend is going up. Um, and what does it mean? It means, as it was mentioned in the previous question uh, a little bit, that uh, we risk uh, really much worse outcomes than we already observe. We risk uh, irreversible changes to Greenland, to Arctic, to many other uh, crucial uh, systems that stabilize climate, and we risk uh, the probability of uh, unchecked warming because the self, full, the, the the positive feedback, the, the the you know enhancing feedback that support for the warming can be activated to much bigger scale than today, and it will be very difficult to stop them uh, at some point. So this is really the increasing risk, and we don't know exactly when can it happen.